Hello and welcome to this video. In this one we're going to be taking a look at this Anki or Anki Sota Series H265 Plus Digital Video Recorder DVR. So this is the control box for your CCTV unit basically. This is a model with 8 camera inputs on it and it supposedly supports 1080p HD video recording. So looking at the box here we can see it shows a little uh, screenshot of the phone app. There's a picture of the recorder itself. Not much on the front, just a couple of indicator lights for power, hard drive and network. It says HD 5 megapixel light, H265 plus video compression, smart playback motion detection and remote access. We've got home business security branding, shows that you own all the devices in a HDMI logo. There's a little bit of information on the side, I'm not going to go over everything. If there's anything that you want to read, you can pause and have a look. But it says it supports up to 5 megapixel light definition, video recording, viewing and playback. It saves up to 7 times more space, apparently, with the H.265 Plus format that it uses. Easy incident video locating for uh, smart search playback, so you can mask areas off and use motion detection on certain scenes, and I assume it will mark that on the playback. I've not actually used this... Uh, brand or model of DVR before. I usually use um, KK Moon, but you can't get those at the moment, they're not in stock. So I got this one off Amazon to give this a go. It says here to download and install the Anke Vision app for remote access, which you can use iOS or Android QR codes there. And then on the sticker down here at the bottom, there's some model information there. It's a DW81KD, along with the other power requirements and serial numbers, which I'm not going to show on video. So let's see what comes in the box. Alright, first thing we can see is the recorder unit itself. So it's got these nice spongy foam packing sides. This is the version without a hard drive, there's no drive fitted. I'm going to put this Seagate one in just for testing. Uh, I would recommend you buy a proper surveillance hard drive for these though. This will only be temporary because the hard drive hasn't turned up for it yet. But get something like a Seagate Surveillance Series Drive or a Western Digital Purple for CCTV recording. They're meant to run 24-7 for constant recording, those kind of drives. Standard hard drives are not designed for that and they'll fail a lot quicker. But anyway, there's a, a quick free step remote access guide there. And then you can scan this, download the app, scan the QR code on the device and then look on your phone. Simple as that basically. Here we've got the unit itself, it's a matte black finish, there's those three indicators. I'm assuming this is an infrared sensor for a remote control or it might just be some sort of a vent or maybe it's a, a buzzer. We've got a couple of vents on the side, it looks like a fan vent but there's no fan in it. The other side is just vents as well. On the back we've got video inputs, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8, all of these are on BNC standard connectors. Then you've got a VGA out for a computer monitor, a HDMI out for a TV or a monitor. You've got an audio in and out for a microphone, LAN or Ethernet port to connect to the internet, and two USB ports that are usable for pen drives and mice and things like that. And the powered input from the power supply. What else is in the box is in this sleeve. And there's also some books. So this uh, is a bag containing the quick start guide and then there's a thank you card and it looks like a window sticker I'm assuming. Let's have a quick look at that. Yeah so it's just, a, it's actually not, it's sticky on the back not the front so you can't put it in a window unless you put it on something and put it, I mean you'd think the front would be sticky but just as protected 24 hour video surveillance. Then in here. The accessory pack includes a USB computer mouse for controlling it. You actually get a HDMI cable with this, which a lot of them don't give you that. Usually you don't get a video cable with them, so that's nice. We get an Ethernet cable. Then you've got the SATA cable, which is for your hard drive. The SATA power cable for the hard drive. 
so we'll need those in a second. Then you get the wall wall power supply adapter. I'm assuming this will be 12 volts at 2 amps. So yeah, this is actually 12 volts DC at 1.5 amps, positive in the centre. And then there's also a bag here that contains some screws, which these will be for mounting the hard drive into the recorder. So let's do that now. Okay, so I've got the two cables, the four screws, the drive I'm going to put in temporarily, and the recorder itself. So to open this thing, there's a screw on either side, and that's it from what I can see. So I'm just going to take those out. I think there's actually some at the front as well, but we'll have a look now and, and soon find out. So These are actually quite long screws in the back. Yeah, and there's also screws here in the side, both sides at the front. Okay, so with the four screws out, just slide the top off, like so. Just put that out of the way for now. And now you can see the internal connectors. I'll just pull down. So this is the internals of the recorder unit itself. So this here is your SATA port. That's where the hard drive plugs into. So we get the blue cable and click that in like so. When you're putting this in, just pay attention to the L shape there and make sure it's the right way around. And then we've also got this big connector here, which this one plugs onto, to power the hard drive, like so. Then the hard drive itself mounts into these holes here. You'll notice that they're actually uh, teardrop style cutouts. So what that means is we should be able to put the screws in the bottom of the drive but not tighten them up and then slide it on. So let's have a look at that now and test that theory. Okay, so I've put the screws in the bottom of the hard drive in these four holes here, as you can see, but they're not in all the way. Uh, this cable is kind of in a silly place across the front here. Let's just have a quick look at that first. Oh, it's, there's a lot of slack on it, so we could either unstick that and put it over the top of the hard drive or what I'm going to do is just try and pull it through a bit, like so, and have it come up there instead. So it clears the drive, it goes underneath. So let's make sure that the connectors are pointing that way, where the connectors are. Otherwise the cables won't be long enough. And I'm just going to drop that down. I can also have a look underneath here and see how it's fitting. Now these screws are actually not long enough to go over the cutouts, which is a shame. So I'm actually going to have to remove them. That was actually going to be a really good uh, plus point. But it turns out it's not the case. So let me just set these screws out. Okay, so I've took three of the screws out again. I'm just going to put one corner in first. Like so. I'm not going to tighten this all the way up, I'm just going to leave it a little loose because that gives me the manoeuvrability to move the drive around as you can see there and line up these screw holes to put the other screws in. I find if you do diagonal corners first that tends to be the easiest way of doing it and you can actually tighten it once you've got two in and then just put the rest in. Something else to note whilst we're underneath here and screwing the hard drive in is it's got these holes here which I would say are for wall mounting it so if you put some screws in the wall, you can then hook this over and have it mounted on the wall, which is kind of neat, I guess. So anyway, back to the top, the hard drive's in. Let's just connect up these cables again, paying attention to the L shapes on the connectors. Put the big one on that side. Like so, and they should click in. And the little one goes on this side here that way around with the clip at the top like so and I can just push them down a little bit so they don't stick out the case and get the lid back on slide the lid back over making sure that this lip goes into the front here 
and then I'll put them four screws back in the outside of the casing. Okay, so I've now got the unit plugged in to this monitor and I've got a mouse connected to the unit. I'm just gonna to use to set it up. I'm gonna go through the quick first time setup process on it. Just have a look through that and format in the hard drive. I'm not gonna to go too in depth. I'll just show you the basic first time run through. So the unit's starting up, it's just beeped, the power light is on, the screen is waking up, there's a little splash screen. Okay, first select the language, English next. Username, admin, it's set by default. We've got to pick a password for the admin account. You can use email to reset password. So I'm just going to try and click activate here without putting a password in for now. No, apparently the email is required. Yeah, no. I'm going to... I can't actually turn that off. Right, so I've just put a password in and an email for now. Just to show you through this, I'm going to reset all this in a minute anyway. So I'll click activate. So now it's asking to draw an unlock pattern. Oh, interesting, okay. Again, I'm just going to do that. I'm going to change all of this. So this is definitely running Android, I would say, looking at some of the stuff that it's showing. We're in London time zone. I want day, month, year formatting. It is not the 5th, it is the 4th of the 2nd at the time of doing this. And it is... 2029. So we'll go with that. Uh, NTP is for Internet Time Server. So this, every so many minutes, it'll talk to this server and make sure that the time and date is correct. Uh, I There's actually no point in me enabling this because this one isn't going to go on the internet, this recorder. So I'm going to go next. DHCP, you probably want checked. When you have this enabled, what it does is it gets an IP address automatically when you connect it to your router and configures it itself. If you don't check these, you'll have to enter all these manually. If you don't know what you're doing, just leave both of these checked on auto. So here's the page where you would set up the remote viewing with their app. I'm not going to do this because this unit isn't being connected to the internet. But this is where you would go through and enable and set this up if you wanted remote viewing on a phone or tablet. Then we've got add camera wizard here. So custom add. This must be this is for adding IP cameras, yeah. So if you have uh, IP cameras as opposed to analog video cameras this is where you'd add them here I don't have any of them so I'm going to click next and here it's showing us the storage devices so it's from the hard drive it's 500 gigabytes it's uninitialized so if we just check this here and click a knit and it says we'll erase all the data on the hard drive okay it'll go through and initialize and format it into the format the recorder supports and then it should be able to detect that it's got all free space and start writing to it there we go. So format is RW, which means read-write. It's detected that it's 465 gig, and it says this 434 gig free. It'll allocate so much uh, for the recorder software. So then we can click finish. And that's our initial setup done for this thing. So now if you double-click on any of these cameras, if you had cameras connected, they would come full screen. You can also right-click here, and it gives you a menu with all the different cameras on. You can click here for live view, here for playback, so that plays a recording back to you. So if you click into here, you can choose which cameras you want to watch. So you can only watch two at a time apparently. Uh, yeah, so you can only check two playback devices, which is a shame. I prefer ones that can play them back all simultaneously. But You have search here, so you can search through dates, times, etc. Here's the settings itself, so here you can set the video resolution for the output from the recorder unit. So you can put it to 1080p display if your screen supports that of course. Uh, you can enable the wizard to do the first time setup, enable the password if you want to. I'm just going to turn that off because again this isn't going on the internet and this is just to show you the setup. NTP will be enabled there if you want it to update internet time. You can manage the users, exceptions here. So this will set up uh, things that it will warn you for. So for this, uh, we can look at 
hard drive error. So when there's an error with the hard drive, we can make it make an audible warning. So it will beep or start buzzing at us. I usually put that on. Hard drive full, there's no point enabling because the hard drive will be classed as full. And when it gets full, all it does is it just starts re-recording in a loop. So don't turn on your hard drive full warning. Uh, IP conflict, I generally put a warning on for that as well. Illegal login, uh, that probably means a failed login attempt, so you can turn that on if you want to. Again, I'm not putting this on the internet, so it doesn't matter. And recording exception, I'm going to put that on warning. I'm going to put this on warning, because I'm assuming that means when it has an error and it can't record to the drive. So yeah, there we go. That's uh, That's the basic settings that I would put on any recorder. You've got network settings here, all the other settings for email and everything else, if you wanted to go through those. You've got camera settings here, so you can set the analog cameras to HD CVBS, which is the onboard BNC connectors on the back, the hardwired. Or you can set them to IP camera mode, which is where they work over the network. This supports up to two IP cameras, apparently. This is where you'd add the IP cameras. Is the on-screen display. So under here, you can choose any of your camera inputs, rename them here to whatever you want. Choose whether to put the name on the screen or not. You see this information here. The date, the week. Uh, you can choose how to display it. So you can have it fl transparent flashing, transparent not flashing. Uh, so non-transparent will put a black box behind it. Uh, transparent will just show you the numbers. So you can have flashing or not flashing. So non-transparent not flashing or transparent and not flashing are generally the two ways that I would use. I'm going to go with non-transparent because it makes it easier to read. You can also choose whether you want to put their name on. So I'm assuming that enables and disables the logo. So if we do that and apply. Alright, okay. So all that seems to do is put a name in the corner there. Interesting. Smart event here. You can choose the cameras. 1 through 8. And you can enable motion detection. Choose where you want the motion to be detected from. If you want to enable or disable that mode, I'll clear it. So where you select here, so if you go clear here, that is now not detecting anywhere. If I draw on here and I would just want motion detection there, it will just detect those frames. Or I can draw the whole screen, like so. Once you've selected everything, if you want to deselect an area, you can do a small area just like that. So that's that. Sensitivity control for that there as well. I'm in schedule. So this is when it is motion detect mode. So just leave it on continuous generally. You could turn certain times off if you wanted to. Linkage action. So for this, you can make it turn that camera full screen when it detects motion. Or you can make it buzz, send you an email, uh, notify you on your app, etc. Pick which channel it triggers on. Intrusion detection is another one here, same thing, and line crossing, same thing again. So these are just all things you could set up and play around with. Under record here, it'll show you your storage. You can always go here and click a init to completely wipe the drive, or if you change the hard drive, you'll have to go and run a init here and format it. Schedule here, this is where you set when each camera will record. So choose the camera and then choose when you want it to record. Continuous records all the time. Event records only when there's motion detection or whatever. And none doesn't record at all at that time. I leave this on continuous all the time. And then you've got various other parameters here for the cameras. So you can choose the camera input itself. Choose whether it's video and audio or just video, which I'm going to set them all to just video. Choose the video resolution of the input. So this is all the choices that it supports of input. The cameras I'm going to be using with this recorder are Hick Vision THC T220 cameras, which are 2 megapixel ish, I think, and they're 1920 by 1080p resolution. So that's what I'm going to be using on this unit. You can choose a recording frame rate all the way up to 15 frames per second, a video bit rate, which is fixed, the encoding type, so you can have H.264 or 265 recording. And then your substream is the stream that you view remotely on your phone. So if you were watching this on your phone, 
this is what video quality you would be looking at. The lower the quality, the quicker and more responsive it will be with slower connections, but I prefer higher quality generally. You can choose the frame rate as well, which is up to 12 frames per second, and the max video bit rate. By default it's 512 kilobits, but you could turn that up all the way to 3 meg. And by default, remote substream viewing is H.264, not 265. If you want to get rid of this menu on the right, just right click here and that goes away and it will show you just the cameras. Right click enables or disables the screen, double click pulls up a specific camera. So there you go, if you found this video helpful, please leave a like. Any questions, put them in the comments section down below and I will try my best to answer them. And get subscribed to future random technology videos like this one. Thanks for watching.